I often forget to buy things like milk and water. And it would usually, in London, you, you're usually about two minutes walk from somewhere. But here, yeah, I can't. Now I can't. It's too late. So it's that bizarre thing. You plan ahead. Aside from riding a bike through the rain, it sounds like it's, it's been a, a positive change for you for the most part. Oh, I like riding a bike through the rain. It's quite um, invigorating sometimes. <laughs> it wakes you up anyway. But overall, you'd say it was a good move for you? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's more, it was, yeah it's, I guess it's more for my son, just a general family thing. And yeah, it's like you say, there's this and that, yin and yang, so. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Yeah, I saw it attributed to Brexit, which you know I'm not sure how seriously to take that. Well, yeah, fairly serious. I mean, not it's not the entire. You know, there's these kind of things. There's always factors for Brexit. It was probably like you know the death knell. It was it was always a plan, but maybe not this soon. But then when you have the plague and Brexit, it kind of certainly helps you decide. I'm certainly sympathetic to the plague side of things. There were moments over the past year and a half where I've wondered what it is that's keeping me in the city when I can't actually, you know, go out and take advantage of any of the reasons why we're here. It's difficult yeah. to hold yourself up in a, if in my case, a one bedroom apartment and really not leave for the better part of two years. Well, I think city, city dwellers, city, city gob- hobgoblins, whatever, that people who have always uh, appreciated the good things of the city and felt that the countryside was some kind of, what? Well, anything out of the city for some kind of um, bizarre sideshow and now beginning to realize that perhaps <laughs> when you have something like this it's like ah oh, maybe i'm living in the worst possible place you miss the city and then then you but then you'd miss the comfort of being in fact it depends on everyone else you're technically sort of in the um what should be the press scrum right now i mean you we would in a normal year be doing this sat down in person you were uh, yeah maybe I, I mean, i've done one one of these about a week ago, uh, the, the Zoom thing. And most of the time, it's, you know, on just email and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Uh, it, I've noticed over the years, the sitting down in a pub with somebody who writes a fanzine element and then just like asking questions and you're just talking for hours thing is kind of gone, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's weird. But it's with, with, with emails, you can kind of think about what you're saying rather than just kind of going, uh, a lot. I went to a party on Saturday, uh, like a real like a re- like a real house party for the first time in a while. And there were pragmatic things that I didn't take into account. And I guess because it's been so long since I really sat down and spoken with people in a noisy environment, I, I lost my voice after, after 20 oh. minutes. It's amazing how much the human body just, for better or for worse, becomes acclimated to hermetic lifestyle that we're all living now. Like, uh, I mean, <clears throat> I'm a fairly, I don't know if somebody who goes on stage, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite, not, I, I'm not as shy as the world. I was shy when I was a child and stuff, but maybe I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, you, you, you have your thoughts and you're not quite sure how, how to. Yeah, I mean, you're an intro, I, I would suspect. Yeah, I'm yeah. the same way. You know, I, I do this. This is part of my then, job. Then you get those moments where you're, you know, with somebody, Especially with someone you, who who you feel doesn't doesn't mind if you just kind of talk gibberish at them, and they can talk gibberish at you, and you can have a lovely hour or three of, of gibberish, shared gibberish, and then kind of sift through the gibberish looking for the kind of intelligent parts of the conversation, or or, or, or not wanting any intelligent part of the conversation. But when it's been like, I think it's been like um, about a year and a half where I haven't really spoken to anyone in that respect and you yeah i think your brain just stops understanding how to do that you know, <laughs> and either you overthink everything wherever it, or you just can't actually you know like right now and you just can't think and you're just gonna a primordial part of your head is gonna somehow come up with something erudite and uh, but if you head in the general direction at some point you'll hit you'll yeah. hit on something yeah, as long as i can in the distance i can see a, a, the, the grain of thought and i can just kind of walk slowly towards that yeah then that's that's fine as somebody who interviews people as part of my job I, I i enjoy the gibberish and i enjoy the talking around things but i do think that there is an expectation because you're being interviewed wanting everything that you say to have some kind of great meaning and that's not something that you can deliver and it's just a sort of a normal you're not going to get that you're putting added pressure on yourself that you wouldn't if we were just sort of sitting down at at the bar talking about whatever well, then, yeah then i'd be a genius then i'd come out with some you know, real grains of wisdom, but 
no, I've got going to deliberately say the worst things now. Now, now you set me up for this. <laughs> In spite of everything, you've been productive during a lot of this. I mean, at the very least, you've been putting a lot of things out into the world. Yeah. It's, I think we've got Comic Gain the, and uh, the, I guess we kind of just settled into this one album every, I don't know, it's four or five years thing. It's only realized because really you have this time and you have this space and you have this um, urge but yeah, it's just kind of rattling out. I just kind of, it's, it's a kind of thing of seeing where, where, when, when the world dries up. Like I've just started doing um, another thing for, it's mainly for Bandcamp. You know, the only real record record I've made is that the one that, that I guess we're here for. Ostensibly, yeah. And then all the Bandcamp things, it's, it's partly so I can pay for food and stuff like that. And, all, and also it's like interesting exercise in seeing what comes out of your head. And, and figuring out how to do everything on your own. And so the thing I'm currently doing was that just like anything under two minutes, it's a, a minute and a half and more kind of like weird punk or freak beat songs or kind of, you know, the way those kind of 60s pop songs or punk songs or just very condensed into just the basics. So, you know, it's that thing of like, and the one after that, maybe I'll try and do just weird long songs or something. It's just kind of nice because it's no one really cares. It's only like, 60 people are going to buy them anyway or whatever it is so it's kind of until i get a proper job it's it you know helps the day go by <laughs> i mean i think you, what you were kind of alluding to is was getting into a certain rhythm and having been in that rhythm of putting out an album every few years that um the faucet is just kind of on to some degree right that that you, you you've almost uh rewired your brain to expect that over a certain period of time you're going to release a certain amount of music I think, I think if you're in a group that, uh, that, that behaves in a very kind of lazy, weird way, where because it's a group, it's not just you. So it's not just someone's going, give us an album every six months, in which case you just do that. You, you, you make yourself get an album worth of songs every six months. And then that's that challenge of like, well, you can do that and it'd be good, or you can't because it takes, you know, only a year to write a good song or something. But it, it was more to do with the fact that we just didn't, that's just not how the monster that was Comic Game works. It just happens when it happens. Or it happens when someone says, can you give us a record, please, or, or something. And then, you know, you have, and there's never usually, no one cares enough to say you have to give it to us by this deadline. It's like, well, no one's going to buy it, so you can just give it to us when you feel like it. So then you can write the songs when you feel like it. But... At least with the kind of like, for instance, with Bandcamp, which I'd never, even, I didn't even know existed before I started doing the stuff on it. You know, it's like okay, it's once a month. It's this day that, that the money goes to the artist, so it's a deadline, and I quite like that idea of having a deadline. In the, for the first time in whatever twenty nine years of making music, it's like okay, and bands in the sixties, you know, they would make three or four albums a year. And of high quality, usually, <laughs> depending on the band. And it's it's kind of thing of like, I, I'll do it. And even though only 50 people might buy it, I want it to be as good as I can possibly make it. And then you just kind of, or you work, you do it, you try and do it, but you try and do it in a way that's fun to you. And also it's like, well, you know, what can be my angle? Not angle, it sounds like, it sounds like some kind of um, something you plan, but like a, a concept or something. like Parameters that you're setting for yourself. Yeah. I was going to do songs under two minutes, so I'm just going to do songs that uh, just use the word pumpkin in the title, or, you know, wherever it is, that's quite fun. And I guess in stretching your, you try, you have to stretch your imagination to do that in some way. And then you get lazy towards the end and you think, oh, I'm just going to rip off this song here. And just <laughs> change the words. So, um, Are these useful exercises when it comes to what you consider the main product that you're putting out into the world? Well, I don't, I, I don't have to worry about it as much. I don't have to, I mean, I don't have to kind of like, there's not as much weight on, you know, the record, I'm, the, the proper record I made, it was kind of like, I might only get to make one solo record or one more. Every, every record I make, I kind of think this is probably the last one because everyone's just going to want another one after this. So I've got to try and make it as good as I can. But with this kind of stuff, it's a very ephemeral throwaway thing almost which maybe adds to the, the just kind of freedom of it. It's, you know, it's like it, no one really cares or no one really matters. It's, it's not even a physical thing. So, it, which is the weird thing to me. It's like, I, I can't, you know, I, I don't like the idea that even of 
any of our records would be not on vinyl because to me vinyl is a very important part of the whole process of having you know having this physical thing that's like you grew up with so there are none of these things they just kind of exist in the air to me it's like making a mixtape or something just for one person so but it's 50 people or 70 people so yes it's completely different because it's like but at the same time it's like when you're doing the song it's still this is still the same you're trying to write chords and words that have some kind of meaning or sound good but you can be a bit more you know, you can be a bit more, uh, I just don't really care. I don't know, maybe not, I don't really care, but, you know, you can, it doesn't matter as much. There's a certain pressure that comes with people, one, I mean, spending more money, you know, spending more of their, their, their hard-earned money on something, and two, sort of knowing that regardless of the quality of, of the thing, it's going to sort of exist in, you know, people's homes for for a long time. Yeah, I mean, there's that thing of having a spine, you know, the, the, uh, I guess most people have their records lined up in an Ikea a uh, bookshelf thing and you see the spines like they're like their books and you pick them up and it becomes this real kind of thing that has a weight to it maybe a historical weight to, you know has a, has a part and you put it next to things that sound like it or something like that where something you're doing month like every couple of months and you know what tends to happen is for the, the, the first day the, the 50 or 60 people that, that want it will buy it and then You'll get a few stragglers that will buy it. A few, and then it kind of just disappear, dissipates into the you know the the world of music. So it's not like a real thing. But like I say, I try and make them as I do honestly try and make them as good as I can. I know it's not something. It's going to be. I'm not going to spend four months doing it where I'm rehearsing it with other people and and changing it as much as I can, and then going to a studio. And you know, we're, and all that process, and then mixing it. I'm basically just sitting in the room I'm sitting in now, and doing it, and then it's done. But sometimes that might make it better because it's it's, it's throwaway. Things. Some of the best records that exist are just these throwaway things that are done very quickly. Where you limit that, that, those bands that just limited themselves to just three chords. You know, if they knew more, you can do more with that those three chords by not doing more than and overdoing it and overthinking it and over-egging it. I've noticed that with Common Game in particular, that there is a there is sort of a long tail, so to speak, to a, a lot of the, the music that it is. These are albums that people keep rediscovering over the years. Now, partially, you know, about 10 years ago, there was, there was that compilation that I think really brought you onto a lot of people's radar, definitely here in the States. But having these things out in the world, it's almost cyclical and and you can almost expect that maybe when the album first is released into the world there might not be a ton of people buying it but down the road people will rediscover these things yeah it's not i'm not i mean it's not like a huge blow to me that no one's buying it. <laughs> if only a few people are buying it it's not because that's not why i do it and and really you know, that compilation you made me think of the there's a lot of songs on that, for instance, that were done in the very same way, where it's just that we were in the studio and we needed, we just had a song. And we'd have, you'd have a riff and you'd just do it. And you'd write the words in the pub while everyone set set up the drums or something. And it was, there was a lot more of this kind of instantaneous, here it is. Kind of, we, had, we had this record called Realists and that was pretty much done like that, just instant, really instant. And it wanted, I wanted it to sound like that. And, uh, my friend Chris, who lives in America, some, from San Francisco, he was over on holiday and he, he, I just told him to be the drummer. <laughs> and, you know, his hands were like bleeding by the end of the, the day. We just did it, most of it in a day or two days, I think, just kind of doing these songs that nobody had heard. And I'd only half written. R- written isn't really the word, but, you know, expel, it expulsed from my brain or wherever it came from. So I kind of like that. doing these other things. It's kind of a bit like getting back to that feeling of it, like not being too precious about. Because yeah, I guess the more you make records, especially if they're kind of the kind of record like the album, the proper album, you know, they, they're more like tender songs or they're more kind of song songs. So you, song songs, you kind of have to work on a bit. You have to make sure that they have the right, you know, the legs and the arms go with the kidneys and the lungs and where. I like, you know, sometimes it's just fun to do songs that just explode out of your backside. 
and you just let them do it, do what they want. Is there a case though in this specific instance where something has been created with these parameters of uh, uh, and an expectation that it's going to go out on into the world through Bandcamp, but has taken on another life, or is something that you know you feel is has a value that it deserves a life beyond just that Bandcamp release? I don't, I don't really think that. I mean, there's probably. Um, it may be at some point I'll make a record where I'll use some of those songs and maybe try and improve them. Did anything on the solo album start as one of those sorts of projects? Well, I hadn't, I hadn't done that yet. I, 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 yeah, I'd only become aware of the whole band camp um, thing after I did that record, where it was, it was just kind of like, uh, yeah, kind of, <laughs> yeah, I just, so I, I'm, I'm very new to, I mean, I'm, I'm new to computers and all kinds of things. And so, you know, I'm just stumbling through the dark with it all, really. You know, who, people who, in a lot of cases, it's, it's younger people. It's people who are tech savvy, but who still feel so married to the traditional release schedule that, that they don't just put things out into the world, you know, that they, that they don't use like Bandcamp to put, put to, to put demos or, or other songs out there. And it's something that you've, you know, in, in spite of being relatively new to have, it seems like completely embraced. I mean, it might partly be because of the, the, the way I, the, the, you know, my current life style is that I, you know, I can do it. And it quite, I kind of, the, the whole thing about being here is like, doing things I've never done, <laughs> trying to learn another language and trying to work with another country and all these kind of different things and living somewhere that's completely alien to me, even though it's beautiful. So when it was this thing of like making music on a computer, just seemed like the idea just seemed horrible to me. But I kind of, you know, I can't spend the rest of my life living in 1984 or whatever it is and just making songs on a cassette player. So you've got to kind of, get with it so it was like well i'll just try and it, you know there was a lot of like shouting at the computer about why is it doing this and why are you doing that but basically it's like a it's, it's you know i'm combining i'm still using the same crappy guitar and the same crappy fuzz box and everything and and there's the the thing i use to make the you know the it's like garage band it's not there's all kinds of like incredible things you can do to it and beats and whatever and I kind of deliberately ignore it just because it's like, well, I've got a reverb thing and I've got my instruments. That'll do. So it's not like, you know, I'm trying to make it sound like a kind of million dollar record. I, I still want it to sound like a, a 10 pound record because that's what I like to sound. I like, you know, I like cheap sounding records. If, if it's going to be that kind of thing. I mean, I like the fact that my, my proper record sounds almost like a proper record, even though it's still got me singing out of tune and, whatever but then there's a place for this where it's like i don't know if people still make that kind of music where it's just still an aesthetics kind of music kind of cheap sounding but it has more of a heart or a more of, there's something more to it more human to it because i guess a lot of people who use these kind of things it's for dance music and electronic music and stuff like that where it's great to use all these all the technology that they need but i you know to me it's a means to an end so I can I can make shitty sounding cheap lo-fi music with modern technology. Why not? <laughs> I think back on a lot of my favorite records, especially coming out of the '90s. You know, early Guided by Voices or the Mountain Goats, things that were at least initially recorded that way. I assume out of necessity, and then at a certain point, it did just become kind of the aesthetic of the era and now i i suppose the impulse is for a lot of people if they have access to technology on the cheap that can make them sound like a pop star then why why wouldn't they make themselves sound like a pop star yeah i mean yeah there's two kind of things of, of like i mean garage punk music is i love 60s garage punk music and and most of those bands they the, the, it sounds the way it does, all kind of cruddy and stuff, because they had no choice. They they were either literally making it in a garage or the cheapest local studio they could find. I mean, they would have wanted to sound like the Beatles if yeah, they could have exactly, sounded like the Beatles. Exactly. That's the appeal of it to some people. But yeah, if they had the choice, they'd be using George Martin and, and whoever. And where now you have, you know, garage bands since the 80s or whatever, who the whole job, they you know, actually go into good studios to try and recreate a, a cruddy, scummy sound. 
because they want to stay true to the blueprint of the, the record, the music they love, which is fine. And sometimes it just doesn't sound right because it's it, they still can't help but put on like proper drums or whatever. And so this is bizarre thing. I mean, you also get these bands that, like you, you mentioned, kind of 90s bands that, I remember like the Chills, who are a great band, the Flying Nun band, and, and their records started out very kind of, not lo-fi, but, you know, there was a kind of cheap 60s sound to it. And when they got signed to a major label, the sound would get improve, improve, improve. And a lot of bands, indie bands, would make these kind of proper produced records, but they lose the element that makes them actually kind of... People hated that Guided by Voices record that was recorded by Rick Ocasek. Yeah, so there's a, there's a weird kind of... Yeah, there's a weird kind of, I don't know, where the ground is where you kind of, you want to sound cruddy, but you have the ability to make it sound fantastic, but you have to kind of find a middle ground. I don't know, I don't know. The- I think that there are certain, certain positions we adopt at certain points in our lives that almost become arbitrary. Are there things over your career that you felt like you didn't do because they weren't punk enough. And, you know, in hindsight, you, you wish you had done them. And, and I wonder if the sort of initial disconnect between you and recording anything on a computer was when you really examined it almost seemed like kind of a, an arbitrary wall that you had put up. No, I don't really examine it. I don't really examine it. But, uh, I, mean, I remember when we, when we the first, um, first version of the band, well, we made, we made, uh, two records and the second one we made for Be- was for Beggar's Banquet basically so they, they, they thought we were going to be the next Blur or some terrible thing like that don't know why and uh, we, we made this record where it, it was kind of the majority of the, the, who was in the band then wanted to make a big sounding pop record and spent you know a lot of money that I presume are still paying off to Beggar's Banquet on like flutes and strings and stuff. And then I had my songs. It was kind of, the songs were kind of split between me and um, two other people in the band. And uh, my, mine were just, I just wanted to sound better than, than just, you know, lo-fi. Because we were making a kind of a pop record, I guess. But not in any way that way. And I would just be sitting there horrified and, and kind of in despair at all this kind of very modern sounding production and dr- everything was so clean and um, and everyone else in the band was just like yes we're going to go, you know we're going to be pop stars or whatever and in hindsight listening to it now it's kind of like well no it's still it just sounds like shit still it's just <laughs> it's just a bit slightly cleaner version of that but um at the time, I just, I, yeah, I remember like just thinking it was the worst thing that could possibly happen, and I was betraying all my punk rock root, I, you know, everything, and and it wasn't that a big deal because I don't think anyone really would have noticed except for the, the people that are doing it. So you had the band split completely between those who wanted to make a Fleetwood Mac album and then someone who wanted to just sound like I don't know the Swell Maps, but. But a pop swell maps or something. So you, you feel like you would have taken heart if you had realized at the time that it still sounded shitty in spite of everything. Well, I mean, it, at the same time, you have that thing of like someone's giving you money to make a record, and when you're that young and you just and it's your second record, you just you know you just can't believe that you're actually doing it. So you don't complain as much. You, you complain in your head, and you go home and you feel like you, you know you just feel like the world is collapsing in on you. But at the same time, you realize it's like there are people out there that would kill to be, they're just sitting in their bedrooms writing probably really good, better songs than you are, but they'll never get the chance to kind of be in a, a good recording studio and have someone release it. So, you know, you can't feel too bad. And then 25 years later, it doesn't matter. You mentioned Fleetwood Mac and, and I, I love a lot of Fleetwood Mac or like, you know, I mean, the Beach Boys are one of my all-time favorite bands, and obviously these are like yeah, huge I mean, sure, I, uh, yeah. produced I mean, records. It wasn't true to the thing that I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Beach Boys records. And if I want, if I was trying to make a Beach Boys record, if I was trying to make Surf's Up or Sunflower, then I'd probably be really happy and probably think this isn't this isn't quite hi-fi enough. But I, uh, you know, at the time, I was probably in that kind of indie mindset of like I just want to make a record that says, uh, sounds as good as a, a, TV, a TV personalities record or something 
and that that's yeah you, i think especially in those early days you look to the bands that inspired you and you're just happy to make music that can be slightly the acolytes of that kind of music in terms of the sound as well as everything else so yeah especially in those early days i where your music existed was in this interesting place of you know, I, I saw you reference like Subway Sect in, in, in an interview that you had done earlier at this. And I know that, you know, as with a lot of other Londoners, you were kind of immersed in, in that Northern soul scene as well. And a lot of these, at least initial aesthetics of the band came out of this tension's not the right word, but desire to almost filter soul music through a punk setup. And maybe that's something that would have been lost. I think I don't, yeah, maybe it's just a, lo- a London thing at that time. You can only you know you judge things by how you how they were to you. Me and my friends around that. Yes, yeah, since I was into music and stuff, there was a kind of mi- you couldn't really say I'm this. You can just say oh, oh, I'm a mod or I'm a soul because you go to someone's house and they'd have punk records and the Cramps and the Fall and the Velvet Underground, and lots of sixties stuff and Garage and Psych. And, Lots of soul, Northern Soul, and Tamla, and 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 then indie. Th- you know, it was it was a melting pot mix of things. But then you know, bands would tend to kind of try and go for just one aspect of that to sound like the Jam, or to sound like the Velvet Underground, or to sound like the Birds or something. And possibly, Come Again was I mean, we try, kind of tried to just mix it. All. It was a mix of like we tried to mix it all up, as well as films and books that we were interested in. But also because it's like, we didn't really know what else to do. <laughs> I was like, you, you try and write a song and you kind of like, well, I want it to kind of have like Northern Soul beat, but then I, I really want uh, like a birds you could talk, oh, but then we should have like a kind of, like a, and it just happened the way it happened. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge plan. It was just like, I think we just liked so many different things that we, and we, we, we were in such a hurry. We thought, well, no, we might only, make, only make, might make, get to make one record. So let's try and make a Northern Soul mod punk pop you know garage <laughs> you just, sorry, really. do you think if paul weller could have made a motown record he would have because i think he would have i just think that he was like it was filtered through punk because that's what he was able to do but if you know if he could have written you can't hurry love he would have it becomes the way it distills into what you, you you're being honest about it you're being true to yourself you, you, you take something and then it kind of you absorb it but it has to come out through your own persona. Your own persona and also like your, the set of skills and abilities that you well, have. Yeah. And, and, and the limitations that you have as a musician. I mean, when we started out, I, I, I'm still quite a bad musician, but I was a terrible musician. We had like one person in the band who you could probably say was a good musician. So it was also that kind of thing of like, well, we would want to sound like, I don't know, smoky and Smokey Robinson <laughs> or whatever, but it's impossible. So we will, we'll sound like a kind of bunch of drunken idiots trying, trying to do Booker T and the MGs mixed with the Velvet Underground. It's just, and like I say, it, you know, you didn't really overthink it then because it just was like, well, this is, you didn't expect much of it. You know, I didn't expect to be sitting here talking to someone on a computer about, about this <laughs> and certainly what you've been doing with the band camp stuff is is a way to continue to not overthink it because something that you risk during a pandemic in particular when you're just stuck with your thoughts and not much else all day is spending too much time on something and this is this is a way of just getting something out into the world without overdoing it yeah I mean, especially the one i'm doing now it's, it's probably like the, the closest to it what a comic game album would have sounded like when we very first started. You know, it's like even things like, you know, middle eight, I'm not having a middle eight. Well, who wants a middle, what's a middle eight? You know, what's a bridge? It's just going to be, you know, the simplest aspects of music that come, come out and, and the rawest kind of thoughts or, yeah, stupid riffs, things like that. And you kind of miss doing that because after all, you're supposed to progress as a songwriter. You're supposed to kind of keep making this progression lyrically and musically and everything else and i hope i've kind of done that very slightly i mean maybe like every five years i kind of move like half an inch close you know better more to being less terrible or something like that but 
but now it's that kind of I just you know it's, I just want to go straight back to ground zero for a bit, <laughs> and then and then I'll make another proper record and I'll try and write proper songs again or something. But yeah, it's going to be done. So it's it's just a distillation of like here are things that I like about songs and and none of the the filler, all killer, no filler. Yeah, I don't know. It's just like I mean, I kind of like I cycle a lot because I have to. I have no choice. I have to cycle in the rain to the, the supermarket, the uh, post office, and and lately I've just been listening on the bike to lots of kind of. Just simple songs, you know, like um, punk songs or uh, old kind of freak beat compilations or things like that, where everything is very simple. It's like a riff and a, some kind of dumb subject and a, a big chorus. And, you know, there's nothing much there, but it's great. So, you know, I, I just because I'm in my 50s doesn't mean I shouldn't kind of... I think it's that thing of like, if you if you made music and, and you're an introvert... It, an introspective person and you, you know you have to make these kind of sad well thought out records which I also would like to do but I kind of just want to make a stupid dumb kind of fun record as well <laughs> but nobody would be interested so you know, don't quit the danger the solo record is I don't know if I would I mean I haven't had a lot of time with it but in my listening to it I wouldn't say it's sad but it's it's sentimental for sure yeah, well, I'm, I'm quite a sentimental person. And, it, it, you know, the, the songs are, are quite sentimental. <laughs> so at least that, yeah. that is the thing, you know, you, you approach to, if each record you have to have. So it has, I kind of feel should have its own kind of air or its own kind of um, world that it exists in. Sentimentality is a, is, a, is a tricky one. Earnestness is tricky in that, I, I mean, I, I guess punk is a double-edged sword when it comes to this, because obviously there are a lot of very earnest punk bands, but also for a lot of people, that sort of thing is almost caked in irony, you know, that it, that it's, uh, there, there's almost a fear of being sort of too, too open or, or too honest on a record or, you know, sounding, you know, too much like high school poetry or being too sentimental. Do you feel like those two sides are in conflict in you? Well, no, I, th- I think as long as you're honest, first of all, and, and you, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, yeah, be honest and make it possibly, I don't know, it, you can either be honest where it's just like maybe of no interest to anyone else. I don't, I don't know, maybe you don't think about it, just kind of just write, just write the song and you'll tend to, you, you'll tend to kind of like when you, you know, you're singing it back or whatever, you can realise if it's just, if it's just too moany or too, too kind of, no one's going to be interested in this. Or there's something that maybe other people can find some kind of home in, you know. I like quite a lot of, there's a lot of songwriters I like who are very, you know, incredibly honest. And, but you, there's something about that that draws you in because you can have a parallel version of it that inhabits your own kind of heart or whatever. When we talk about sort of very lyrical very honest songwriters, Leonard Cohen comes to mind, who's somebody who like still has a sense of humor. I mean, his stuff, when it's funny, it's very funny. And there's a line on my last listening, there was a line about Kerouac that really jumped out of, out at me. That was something like, I, you know, to paraphrase something along the lines of like, I, I bought eight Kerouac books and only read four because you kind of get the gist after, after the first couple. It's a good example of something that's honest, but Still has a a wry sense of humour about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. The, I know the the, the, what the lyrics you mean. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of true. You know, you especially when you're younger. You know, you're encouraged. It's like I'm, I'm. I really like beat poetry and stuff like that. But you do realise oh, I bought all these Kerouac Jack Kerouacs when I was younger because that's what you do. In the same way that you know you have to have all the albums by whoever the underground or you read. But then you kind of think, well, you know, I didn't really need to read half of them. Because so it's just, yeah, it's being honest that something that maybe can um, appeal to someone else. <laughs> Most of the time, it's just, you just sit there and you just write it and it just comes out. It just pours out, and for me anyway, and it, it just pours out. And then it's just a case of kind of crossing out the ones that just sound really stupid or really kind of pretentious or whatever. Sometimes it's just that simple. You know, I think because it is such a, a lyrically forward record that it, it maybe isn't something that you could have recorded into a garbage can, you know, that it, that it is something that like the production has to serve the lyricism because it is something that's so 
important to the music. Yeah, sorry, the cats. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it kind of just. I had an idea in my head of how I wanted the record to sound, and then songs. But yeah, you know, it was yeah, just it, it, just the way it was. No, just one. Just one is you know they're they're kind of emblematic of each other. You, you know they. You, you, as you, you know, I, I can't remember how it how it works, but it was kind of a case of just like this is the kind of record I'm going to make, and then the new songs, and then the, and then luckily, you know, the production becomes kind of part of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like there was a sort of uh, a built-in nostalgia or built-in reflection based on the fact that you moved. I mean, the fact that you were literally unpacking boxes sounds like sort of you know if, if not the necessarily the genesis of the project then at least like a very important focal point to it well there's i mean i noticed a lot that during i guess it's a natural thing but i guess during, during the lockdown a lot of my friends came very friends that weren't like that before became very nostalgic and there was a lot of like lots of people posting pictures of you know what they were like when they were younger and stuff like that and and while that was happening, I was kind of moving into this completely new, new era. So I was kind of very much, I still am kind of very much in the present and thinking about, okay, this is what we're going to do. So it was a way to exercise the past rather than dwell, instead of like dwelling on it and becoming immersed in it and, and finding solace in it. So, you know, it's a little extent that, but it's kind of like, just document it so I can leave it. You know, we were talking about sort of the pastoral setting earlier and, and you, you do have a, uh, certainly a much more domestic life than, than you did previously. I guess how much of that is a product of this global pandemic and, and how much do you expect to kind of return to, to touring and sort of being an active musician in a very different way, you know, knock on wood once this all dies down? I don't know. I, just, I mean, I, 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 I'm being an active musician in the, you know, I guess my main job in the band was to write the songs and, and all that stuff. So I've been very active. And we were never like, it's not, it's not really there we ever did well to us particularly. We, you know, we never kind of overdid it with the touring thing. So it's just, it's just it, the way everything is, the best way to kind of think about it is like this is just, just, just the way it is at the moment. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to worry about it too much. It's like, I'm not going to get kind of my knees stuck in the mud of, sentimentality and nostalgia about you know, I don't like London I haven't been in London you know I lived in London for pretty much all my life and I I don't think I've missed it at all you know and it's uh, mainly because I'm not thinking about it because if you know what what I kind of think well what if I do start thinking about it and missing things and you know I can't do anything about it I can't it's, it's actually quite difficult to actually go back at the moment so it's just don't bother just kind of just keep keep going on seems to be the best way what about touring what about playing in in a band do you, do you miss those i mean i mean i, I think I've got, i'm gonna play some shows next year i don't know how many or what you know in what format but um no i didn't mean i, I think before we before everything started happening i think i said oh i was going to take a year off anyway <laughs> uh just from the whole because there was aspects of it that would really get, make, that would really stress me out. You know, it gets kind of quite stressful sometimes doing gigs. So um, now I feel like I've had that, you know, there was no, it, it didn't really matter because I took a year off. I was going to take a year off, but now I've taken a year and a half off, wherever it is, or two years. And now, yeah, now I kind of feel like it's kind of a worthwhile time to do something else. But the common game projects come together when somebody sort of takes the initiative or, you know, decides there needs to be, I guess, a new tour or, or a new album. But I would assume from the outside that that by necessity needs to be you most of the time. Right. I mean, th this idea of being a band is it's, it's a very nebulous thing when it comes to comic. Game. Yeah. Well, it's like, I, I tend to be the one that gets asked, I guess, you know, we don't have a manager or anything like that. So I'll, I'll maybe I'll get a message from someone saying, can you do this gig and, and, you know, I, half the time it doesn't happen or someone doesn't want to do it and then we kind of all think, oh, okay, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's the worst run band 
I've, uh, but isn't that isn't that part of the strength though? I mean, isn't that kind of why it still exists? Well, I think it's because maybe that's why we're still going. Is is because it's never really mattered. <laughs> so, you know, it's not it's not really high on our list of um, things we want to achieve. Is being a well run machine. It's just uh, stumbling stumbling around really. Even though I've just made you know I made a solo record and I'm doing all this other solo stuff. You know, the band still exists because it's, it's one of those bands. It's not like we have to do a year, a, t- a tour, an album a year. It's just uh, we do what, do something when we want. <laughs> I've noticed that the, the, the history of the band is littered with these stories of one or two members showing up to perform. <laughs> to perform oh, a show. Yeah, horrible, yeah, there's horrible stories. There's so many. <laughs> there's, yeah, or band, or band members who never turn up and, uh, and you have to grab literally the first person who looks like they can play an instrument or something. There have been a lot of shows in other countries where it's been strangers who just, we just play Louie Louie or something because someone got too drunk the night before and didn't turn up at the airport or, but you know, I've stopped, it's, it's, it stopped mattering. In fact, in fact, it was probably like, it's probably part of what should, it should be the, the, the case with the band. I think if that didn't happen every now and again, I'd be disappointed. If if you would become basically if we became too professional, I kind of uh, that's when I would think maybe it's time to stop. If we became like a, a normal band, and rehearsed, and things like that, horrible, horrible things. Do you assume? Do you anticipate? Do you expect that there will be another comic game record? There, there's there's half the songs are done for another one, um, but then yeah, I got yeah, I got caught up in this kind of factory aspect of making all the other ones so that yeah there, there, will, there will be another record it's just when you know it doesn't it doesn't matter <laughs> it'll, it'll happen when it happens <laughs>